Good evening, dear students, colleagues, friends and listeners around our many homes in these troubling times of a planetary crisis. We hope that you and your near ones are safe and sound. You are listening to the first live stream of the CCC public seminar of the CCCRP Master Program Visual Arts Department Head Genève. The acronym CCCRP stands for Critical Curatorial Cybernetic Research Practices. We are one of three international master programs of the Visual Arts Department at Head Genève. We are specialized in developing profound research practices with the students that are project specific and transdisciplinary by means of contemporary art. At this moment, the program is spread around homes and at friends' places in Italy, France, Greece, Switzerland and Germany. Since 2015, the CCC Public Seminar is an open forum and transversal platform to the students and to the general public. It invites you to join us to think and to think differently by the means of art research about specific questions, concerns and problematics of the contemporary condition. We usually sit around a large table at our seminar space and on Boulevard Helvetique in Geneva. It is an informal and communal setting that invites to share thoughts, ideas, doubts, fears and questions. Each year the public seminar circulates around a keyword or a concept or a specific approach. This year, the public seminar is organized by the Critical Studies Seminar that is led by Jean Ray. My name is Doreen Mende, responsible for the CCCRP. Thank you, Jean, for inviting Angela Dimitrakaki, who is our guest for this public seminar. Thank you, Angela, for joining and preparing the public seminar for tonight. Angela Dimitrakaki will speak for about 30 minutes on globalization phase three, the global social reproduction crisis that is followed by a live QA moderated by Jean. Thank you, Doreen. And warm thanks also to Julia Peshur and to Vinit Agarwal for excellent help with the technical prep and setup tonight. It's my great pleasure and honor to introduce Professor Angela Dimitrikaki. Angela is Senior Lecturer in Contemporary Art History and Theory at the University of Edinburgh, where she also directs the Master Program in Modern and Contemporary Art. Angela's influential writings have been much discussed in the world of art and critical theory. They have shaped our understanding and contributed vitally to debates about globalization, about the vexed relation between art and economy, about the growing threat of neo-fascism, and about the still under-recognized centrality of social reproduction labor to a reloaded Marxist theory. It would be no exaggeration to note that Angela has been a prime mover in both the ongoing elaboration of a Marxist feminist theory in politics and in spurring the art world to take seriously and focus on fascist tendencies in contemporary global politics. In particular, we could acknowledge her co-edited special issue on social reproduction in art for the journal Third Text in 2017, and her co-edited special issue, Anti-Fascism Art Theory, for Third Text last year. Angela is corresponding editor of the journal Historical Materialism and a co-organizer of the Marxist Feminist Stream for the journal's annual London Conference. Her current book project is titled Feminism, Art, Capitalism. I've also had the great benefit to be living in Athens, for in addition to the other lessons and illuminations of that troubled city, I've been able to learn from Angela through numerous ongoing discussions and local political work. I'm very certain this talk tonight will jolt, challenge, and inspire us, and will leave its traces for a long time to come. We will live stream a discussion about this talk with Angela at 7 p.m. Geneva time 
on the CCC YouTube channel. We'll join you there. Hello everyone, I'm speaking to you from Athens uh, tonight. Um, first of all, I want to thank you for being here, for being able to, to join us. Um, I also want to thank um, Tin Ray and the faculty for making this lecture possible despite the uh, circumstances in which we all are. You can see the title of my talk um, here in the first slide. Globalization Phase 3, the Global Social Reproduction Crisis. And perhaps the three images um, that appear here already illustrate the situation um, in which we've been in the past month and even longer. So I'm going to talk about globalization and perhaps the um, periodization that the current situation forces um, on this on this term. So, starting with phase one, the long nineties. Globalization became a buzzword across discursive sites, from the press to scholarly analysis in the nineties. After that is the end of the Cold War, which saw capitalism triumph. It was taken up in the art field, this term, globalization, becoming, in the end, the term that would undermine the hegemony of postmodernism. Mention of postmodernism waned gradually until we stopped hearing about it altogether. Seven years before, Nicolas Bourieux announced in 2009 that postmodernism is dead at his uh, tetraennial ultramodern, Okwe Enozor had tried to detach postcolonial critique from postmodernism in Documenta 11 in 2002. In his essay, The Black Box, Enozor had turned to Michael Hart and Antonio Negris recently at the time uh, published Empire. Empire was published in 2000. Empire was a name given to globalization as the realized outcome of imperialism. The planetary reign of capitalism, that is, based on the informatization of work and society where there was to be no outside. Hart and Negri rightly perceived globalization as what postmodernism had said did not exist, a totality. Reinstating the concept of totality was a bold move by Hart and Negri, and yet their analysis was debated furiously in the years um, after Empire's publication. Some critics had a problem with the author's assertion that capital was nation-blind and that Empire was therefore centerless. The continuous hegemony of the USA, not to mention its imperialist policies specifically in Latin America, seemed indeed to challenge the centralness uh, thesis. Other critics took issue with the authors arguing that the traditional working class, known as the proletariat, was no longer relevant or even existed in substantial numbers. And the, they also took issue with their position that a different counterpower existed in empire as capital's global sovereignty. This counterpower, uh, counterpower was the multitude. And they actually um, published a volume, a book, uh, giving it this title, although uh, they discuss the multitude, this counterpower, extensively already in the in Empire as such. So it's true that the multitude was a somehow nebulous concept combining subjects that related differently to labor, such as the informatized worker, the migrant, etc. But at the same time, um, Hart and Negri made it very clear that the multitude was 
the productive force of empire. In fact, Carter Negri went so far as to suggest that in the informatized world order created by capital, this multitude, this productive force, had potentially great power and certainly much more um, than the traditional uh, proletariat which had been excluded from knowledge production. So being in relative, just in relative control of knowledge production, the multitude could in the future transform capitalism um, to communism, as the authors argued, through use of cooperative work and the maintenance of networks. A notable critic of this point was uh, Marxist feminist Silvia Federici. Um, you can see her in this slide, uh, who said at the time that there was such extreme inequality within the multitude that performing the role, that the multitude performing the role of a class rising against the capitalist class was out of the question. And I have provided here uh, an excerpt from uh, a lecture she did in 2006, which was later on published as an article uh, titled Precarious Labor, a Feminist Viewpoint, that kind of gives you an idea of what she, um, she was arguing about and against. I will return to Federici's ideas later on, for what I want to stress now is that Hart and Negri's empire focused on production. This was not entirely clear to the art world at the time, and in Enrizor's essay, for instance, we see that despite his efforts to disentangle the postcolonial from the postmodern, uh, there was a lingering of an identity politics, uh, politics subject that remained cultural rather than defined by and through class. And yet, Documenta 11, as such, uh, credited with being the first major exhibition about globalization, which is why I mentioned here. It included many artworks that articulated the tremendous economic inequality that was already becoming the key feature of life, work and death under global capitalism. This return to the economy was a more general trend. The cultural logic that Frederick Jameson had diagnosed as the heart of postmodernism in his work since um, the mid-80s and definitely in, in, in his book of 1991, um, began being replaced, this cultural logic that he talked about, began being replaced by the late 90s um, with a curiosity about how production was being reordered under the rule of global neoliberalism as a particular um, stage or um, in capitalism or expression, let's say, of its wishes. In 1999, uh, Luc Boltanski and Yves Chapelot published in France uh, The New Spirit of Capitalism, where they argued that this new spirit, evident in the 90s, relied on the appropriation of the once radical artistic critique as a new super exploitative way of producing for the benefit of capital. Also in 1999, uh, Ursula Biermann engaged the video essay form in exploring the lives of industrial female workers. So, yeah, Biermann was. Um, looking at the lives of industrial female workers in the maquilladoras of the U.S.-Mexican border in her um, video essay performing the border. And that same year, uh, Anne-Sophie Sidan completed uh, Vartemal, Prostitution after the Velvet Revolution, um, a work, a complex work on the economic life at the border of Eastern and Western Europe. So both these works, I've just provided a slide from, uh, sorry, um, an image from it. Both these works marked a shift of feminism 
uh, to the economy as a defining framework for women's place in the world uh, that displaced, for instance, psychoanalysis as the prevalent feminist tool up to that point. And also in 99, Alan Sekula offered in uh, Waiting for Tiegas a startling and exemplary uh, social documents on the anti-capitalist battle of Seattle. And that's the last, um, the third, uh, the final image to the right in this, in this slide. So that all happened in 99. I could mention many other examples, but the point I want to make is already apparent. Uh, Jameson's admonition um, in, in the mid-80s, in 1984 already, to proceed to a cognitive mapping of processes that postmodernism was mystifying and occluding from view became imperative in the long 90s. Uh, when it became obvious, that is, that Francis Fukuyama's prediction of a capitalist Pax Romana held value only as a, an ideological fiction. As regarded um, the superstructure, what we Marxists call the superstructure, um, the long 90s opened in literature with Douglas Kaplan's description of a disaffected Western youth that uh, elevated idleness against their jobs at McDonald's. That's actually my own copy here, the first image of that important uh, novel. So, yeah, as regards the superstructure, the long 90s opened with uh, Generation X from 91 and closed with a launch in 2004 of some precario uh, pattern sense of the struggle against precarity. And of course, we also had the Euro May Day um, at that point and so on. So the long 90s was a decade marked by struggles against the supranational institutions of global capital from Seattle to Genoa and many other parts of the world. Strangely, or not so strangely, it was the terrorist attack on New York's World Trade Center in 2001 that helped revive the discredited cultural logic revamped as clash of civilizations, which is an idea that actually uh, existed before 2001, but that kind of gained momentum, obviously, at that point. So it was that attack on New York's uh, World Trade Center which dealt a serious blow on anti-capitalist protests and mobilizations um, in, in, in various guises that have remained with us since the clash of civilizations ideology. And you can see um, one of the remarkable and sad pictures of the events and the cover of the relevant book here. So this ideology of the class of civilizations uh, became a weapon in the hands of the ruling elites who used it successfully on at least two fronts. First, to divide the global workforce into locals and um, migrants, hostile migrants. And secondly, to make acceptable civil life restrictions um, in the West that would place securitization at the core of public consciousness. In seeing the long 90s as the first phase of globalization then, we note that struggles focused on production while analysis and our languages of representation, including art, had not overall operated in terms of an emergency, despite everything that was going on. Uh, climate consciousness was developing, but despite an understanding that globalization came as a culture of acceleration, this was the, the subtitle, actually, of uh, Generation X, the novel, um, the overarching perception was that there was time for knowledge production, there was time for figuring out what was to be done, 
and especially there was time for enjoying privilege, uh, above all the privilege of discourse and debate over whether to adapt to the times or strive for reform. Reform, because revolution was either a bad word or too exhausting to try. But at the same time, we were left with this piece of wisdom that, as put at the time, no one ever took to the streets against postmodernism, but many did against globalization. So, moving on to uh, phase two, which uh, of course involves the global financial crisis of 2008. That crisis intensified attention on globalization as primarily economic. So, um, when we talk about phase two, it's about this um, more intense attention on the economy and the formal economy. The crisis demonstrated the scale of, catas of catastrophe that neoliberalism could unleash on the world. For many, even on the left, it was the global financial crisis that brought things together, releasing them from the dilemma on whether capitalism was in some ways good and could be reformed. As noted by um, Vivek Tiber in 2013, and he was the author of Postcolonial Theory and the Spectre of Capital. So, as he wrote, for the first time since the 1980s, everyone is talking about capitalism, not alterity or hybridity or the fragments, but the ubiquitous crushing force of capital. This was the case in art as well. Kirsten Lloyd and I uh, started working on the exhibition Economy. So we started working on Economy, uh, which took place in Edinburgh and Glasgow in 2013. Um, we started working on it very soon after the crisis uh, in an effort to map artists' multi-layered turn to the constitution of an economic subject. We noted, uh, we had noted already the steep increase both in exhibitions and artworks that centered on the economy since the mid-90s. And the global financial crisis had made these concerns even more visible and unapologetic, so we could see a lot more work focusing on that. The lonely hour of the last instance that Louis Althusser had once said would never come, had come. The crisis was capital's own crude economism that once Marxism had been accused of, and capital as the economy appeared at that point autonomous and above political rule. In saying this, of course, I don't mean to downplay the fact that the financial crisis became a political crisis in the second phase of uh, globalization. And when we, uh, when we were preparing for, for, for the exhibition, the, the world was in turmoil and there was a global, a near global culture of, of, of protest. Capitalists managed to contain the wave of protest, the financial crisis engendered. It managed this primarily with unleashing var uh, various orders of violence on the insurgents, from the police and the army to capital controls. The brutality of the system stood naked, and in my view at least, globalization became the ground of experiments concerning how much the people were able to take without revolting, how far capital could push. Greece, um, where I come from, was subjected to such an experiment 
as a class nation state, and arguably the experiment proved quite successful. Not only there was a huge transfer of value from the people to capital, but the left in government was ridiculed as a failure, and in fact the left overall was contained, um, and that was very important. So the left was contained as a four-year left parenthesis, that's the phrase used, since in uh, 2019, that is last year, the state returned to its rightful managers, the right. Indeed, the right returned to power uh, in Greece with the familiar agenda about development, growth, and the privatization of everything as the solution, despite um, um, everyone talking about uh, the climate, the imminent climate disaster, for instance. But, as in other places in the world, the Greek right had learned its lesson from the waves of protests that had followed after 2008. So, it didn't just come with a package about privatization, it also came with an agenda of authoritarian repression and the aim to preempt any culture of protest against the new onslaughts, which, of course, involved taking down... Um, and attacking any kind of solidarity context, such as the squads that hosted refugees. Um, they did many other things that were part of this new authoritarian um, kind of uh, active, I would say, repression. So in 2019, this new authoritarianism was a global phenomenon in cultures of uh, governance. Um, I hope the, um, the picture here, the photograph here, kind of uh, shows uh, two, two important representatives of this trend. Um, the anti-immigration ideologies that were sown in phase one of globalization could now be used to full effect. Migrants uh, became the number one external enemy that existed in alliance with internal enemies, both of whom had to be attacked by the capital estate. This project of containment was being carried on already for a few years, leading many to speak openly not just about an undermining of democracy, but about the return of fascism. Art institutions integrated critiques of this developing culture in their programs, while some theorists also addressed the situation, even if hesitantly, or at least with less international coordination than the situation called for. Initiatives combining activism, art making, and theoretical analysis, and that straddled the art institution and social life uh, also took hold. Um, with Poland's anti-fascist year, which was initiated early in 2019, being perhaps the best-known European uh, such example. But overall, the urgency of the circumstances was not fully appreciated. Although it was understood, as argued in a roundtable uh, round article in Third Text, uh, also last year, 2019, that this was the moment to join the dots and challenge collectively the business-as-usual production model of the art world and the world at large, business-as-usual was precisely what happens for most. Neofascism has been too complex a phenomenon to be addressed in this short talk. What is important is that neofascism reflected the political crisis of global neoliberalism, exacerbated by the imminent climate disaster. Social reflexes have not just been too slow. Saying this would be, in my view at least, a gross understatement. What can be said instead is that neofascism has been a persuasive narrative for most electorates. 
accommodated to various degrees with mainstream parties committed to continuing uh, the neoliberal project of the formal economy with more formal violence, such as that unleashed against the wave of protests that we also had in 2019 from Chile to France to Canada to Lebanon to India. So we, what we must confront today as we're entering phase three is that this was the state of global politics when COVID-19 moved us to that third phase of, of globalization. And that the neo-fascism that we, we, we started talking about in phase two after the global financial crisis was something that was slowly advancing, kind of being prepared in many ways, experimented with, already from phase one when everybody was, uh, well, not everybody, when the privileged um, people um, of, of, you know, on our planets were, were not suspecting or, uh, what would happen or, or, or seemed to be much, much happier. So, globalization phase three, then. The periodization of globalization presented here has served to help us see the difference of the juncture in which we find ourselves in 2020. Numerous theorizations of the global health crisis described as a war, that's the word used, so described as a war between humanity and a virus, have appeared on blogs, the press, and other platforms. Philosophers and economists and, of course, epidemiologists have argued a range of positions on this new dystopic turn of globalization, which has global mobility um, as a very notable casualty. As you know, the majority of published texts that articulate critical positions fall into two categories. Concerns about the impact of COVID-19 on the global economy and production and concerns about the further, uh, the further curbing of civil rights in societies that were already being reformed as capitalist totalitarianisms. As regards the cluster of texts, the first cluster of texts, uh, there is little doubt that we are before a global crisis of the formal economy that is likely to be of an unprecedented scale and even nature. It also has a geopolitical dimension, um, as at present, at least uh, what I, I, I read uh, kind of recently, was um, that uh, the Chinese economy is the only one that is not expected to contract, unlike those of the West, but rather grow by 3.3%, uh, which may not be ideal for China compared to its 6.1% um, of the past year, but is definitely something. So wild scenarios are presenting themselves in the conditions of our social isolation. As a friend put it to me in an email, and I quote him, China will become a hegemonic global power. Economic crisis will push most of the Western countries towards some form of fascism that they're now exercising. There will be a global war as the new world structure will awake new energies for conflict and the climate crisis will start to kick in. 2022 will open a new year of global horror. Unquote. Um, so, I'm getting very nice um, messages these days. So, these predictions may not be too far off the mark. And they probably represent a new wave of left nihilism. It's not hard, however, to have such thoughts if you are in a lockdown, as millions of us are at present. And if you have been paying attention to what was going on in globalization phase two. More importantly, such an assessment joins the dots between the cluster of texts focusing on concerns about the global economy and the cluster of texts 
focusing on concerns about neoliberalism, pushing further its neo-fascist project of governance. A doctoral student called Tim Christians, author of the widely circulated Mass Society Be Defended from Agamben, which was a critical response to Agamben's recent uh, texts, writings on the pandemic, um, summarized the situation with regard to the conundrum in which the left now finds itself. So here's the quote. The main tactic of, lefti of leftist opposition has become impossible, public manifestations, believing that socialism is upon us simply because governments are, in times of crisis, considering a universal basic income or universal health care is naive. If we should have learned one thing from decades of austerity is that neoliberals never let a serious crisis go to waste. Keynesian and neo-Marxist policies might be considered in times of need, but they will quickly disappear in the annals of history if there is no substantial political backdrop to solidify their effects. If the left fails to grasp this momentum, it will be business as usual once things go back to normal. But how do you organize opposition from the comfort of your home that exceeds free-floating clicktivism? The left is confronted with the challenge of reconstructing the world after COVID-19 and has lost the most powerful weapon in its arsenal. Corona has high their toe only changed the world in various ways. The point now is to give it the correct interpretation to not let it go to waste. End of quote. The contradiction in the above is, is, is hard to miss. Either Corona has actually changed the world beyond the level of a mere crisis, or things go back to normal. At the same time, there's nothing like a mere crisis for capital, which has so far succeeded on realizing its crisis as more and more aggressive opportunities for extraction. As many of us suspected in 2008, the so-called global financial crisis would not be a passing stage after which things would go back to how they were, and in that sense it wouldn't be a crisis at all. But it would be, rather, the very condition that would further, that would enhance the extreme inequality of the distribution of wealth by all means, including a serious, uh, through a serious blow on democracy as so far understood. One outcome of the 2008 crisis was therefore the rise uh, of the left feminist movement. A left feminist movement that centered on anti-capitalism and that drew um, on the more or less forgotten feminist idea of the 70s, which made social reproduction the center of um, of feminism and that is actually where we come again to Silvia Federici who was among uh, the feminists who pioneered this, this approach and of course her, her work became of even uh, greater interest recently after the global financial crisis and in the context of um, having a movement that would center on social reproduction globally I did not mention this development in the phase uh, two section above because feminist thought and activism as such continued being marginalized as still a particular politics within Marxism, which continued focusing on the economy in terms of production. I don't think that reality has sunk in, that we are faced today with an acute global social reproduction crisis, the first of that scale, and that the demand for a correct interpretation in the above uh, quote cannot be realized unless the left centers its politics on social reproduction. So what already, what remained kind of uh, still marginal after 2008 in phase two, 
must actually now come to the fore. But of course this is easier to say than do. What would it mean at the level of strategy? David Harvey did mention social reproduction in his uh, recent analysis for Jacobin, but the analysis as such focused on the formal economy. And um, as I'm um, uh, giving this lecture, uh, the small international Marxist feminist collective I'm part of, with uh, Tithi Benateria and um, other, other uh, Marxist feminists drawn from an international context. Um, by today, uh, I, I hope actually the text that uh, we wrote will have been published, and the text is called Seven Theses on Social Reproduction and the COVID-19 Pandemic. The approach uh, we took is to put forward a list of demands that center on the need to acknowledge that social reproduction workers, waged and unwaged, across size that challenge the traditional uh, distinction between private and public, do the only work that is of service to the survival of the species and its social organization. But to whom are these demands addressed? This is less clear. Or in fact, I could say that they are addressed to the capitalist state as the agency that is acknowledged uh, as de facto responsible for exercising the biopolitics of how we survive and the necropolitics of who is left to die. Moreover, there is, at this point at least, a failure to grasp an emerging divide within the global right, and it is this right that rules most states. So, a divide with regard to the imperative this government's face. In his first announcement addressing the nation, the Greek, the right-wing Greek Prime Minister openly accepted that there are two approaches to COVID-19 at present. One that tries to rescue the economy and one that tries to save lives. While he rejected both uh, Boris Johnson's uh, herd immunity idea um, and Donald Trump's implicit defense of traditional capitalist freedom. Even if the policies that followed upon uh, the Greek Prime Minister's statements have shown a partial, maybe an increasing, commitment uh, to pleasing the private health sector in Greece, I believe that the rift within the global right is at present quite real. Effectively, the rift can be summarized as the dilemma between choosing production, the economy, versus social reproduction, life. And what follows from this for the left is not unlike the dilemma on antifascism that had preoccupied us a uh, year just before the outbreak of the pandemic. Should there be a united left or a popular alliance-based um, anti-fascist front. So th this was a question that we were asking ourselves, should we work with the liberals um, in, in, in addressing, in kind of um, fighting against neo-fascism or not? So likewise, today we need to ask, should we work with those parts of the right that to an extent at least grasp that social reproduction must be prioritized over production? In other words, should we in fact be addressing the state as the agency that we continue to trust with our lives? Or should the left see in the current crisis an opportunity and the very need, the necessity for mobilizing for a social reproduction revolution? One that would certainly mean a communist reorganization of production in the service of this social reproduction revolution. This question must be posed because we are at a fundamental impasse as regards the traditional means of left opposition, meaning taken to the streets. This moment will come, and will come against the state that will not waste this opportunity for pushing for a complete death of, uh, to our physical presence in public space. The measures taken for online work are likely to stay, given the experts' reports, about the periodic return of the threat. Uh, the Imperial College Report 12 from March 26 describes 
a nightmarish scenario or actually three such uh, scripts that could be called bad, really bad and awful. So we read. We estimate in the absence that in the absence of interventions, COVID-19 would have resulted in 7 billion infections and 40 million deaths globally this year. If a suppression strategy is implemented early, at 0.2 deaths per 100,000 population per week and sustained, then 38.7 million lives could be saved, could be saved, whilst if it is initiated when death numbers are higher, 1.6 deaths per 100,000 population per week, then 30.7 million lives could be saved. Delays in implementing strategies to suppress transmission will lead to worse outcomes and fewer lives saved. Suppression strategies will need to be maintained in some manner until vaccines or effective treatments become available to avoid the risk of later epidemics. Um, there was um, a report 13, but... Uh, which came out on uh, March uh, on the 30th of March, but it, it said the same thing. So these are conditions of extreme threats where quarantines and social isolation will become the norm in the months to come. The imperative to strike currently undertaken in parts of the world against capital's demand for production to continue cannot be realized by bringing people out to the streets. People now applaud or protest in their balconies, as you see here, happening in Greece, in Athens. If a global general strike takes place, which would require huge efforts and coordination anyway, and we cannot know what this would mean in terms of food shortages, not to say anything about the shortage of infrastructure, um, such as the internet. This will mean creating a force, a force that remains invisible in public space when the latter is materially conceived. So we're talking about a very different uh, situation here, about a transformation I would say, of the idea of the general strike. The home will be the place where such a general strike would be realized. Should this happen, the struggle that our technologies will hopefully allow for will need to move to the terrain of ideology, the terrain of persuading each other that a centrally planned global health system free for all will not just signal the rise of a new temporary humanism, but an end to the destruction of ecosystems that capitalism is responsible for and that has brought us to this predicament. And we know that the capitalism that accepts limits to growth is not capitalism. How to imagine, in positive terms, this non-capitalism is our urgent ideological struggle. In short, the empire of capitalism must now fall and a reconceived global workforce made of life carriers must take over. And I want to thank you for uh, being here with me tonight. And I stop here.